Hi, my name is Leon Rowe, currency trader and trading coach at trading180.com. And in this video, I'm going to review the euro dollar for the first quarter of 2023 and really get uh, a look into how fundamentals affected price. And um, if you're new to the channel, a warm welcome to you. And if you're obviously returning, um, an equally warm welcome to you. And um, if you don't know, I am quite fundamentally driven. I use fundamentals for my uh, directional bias and then look for the technicals as timing. And if you are new to fundamentals or don't necessarily understand fundamentals or are having a hard time in understanding the fundamentals and applying it to your technicals and really want to try to improve your trading, I have this video obviously that you're watching and several other videos and I will put links to the description and they should pop up in the top right hand side of the video. So whenever you see something pop up, that would be me just uh, recommending um, a fundamental analysis video that I think you should watch. So um, let's get into it. Let's get into the uh, fundamentals and look at the review. So just as a basic um, understanding, and a reminder, I guess, is that um, there are three main, um, I guess, uh, macroeconomic uh, data points that we should look at when it comes to Forex fundamentals and what really kind of moves price, at least over the medium to long term. And they are gross domestic product and inflation. And um, those two will have an effect on interest rates and what the central bank does with interest rates. And so um, looking at GDP first, typically um, when you have gross domestic product and uh, a growing and expanding and a, a boom in the booming cycle of the uh, economic cycle, uh, it typically leads to currency appreciation if you have growth. And if you have contraction, then, you know, into leading into some sort of recessional bust slump phase of the uh, of the economic cycle, that typically leads to currency devaluation or depreciation, right? And so um, looking at inflation, inflation, central banks have a 2% target and a mandate. They are mandated to get inflation to the 2% target. Now, 2% um, inflation is actually an acceptable currency devaluation. It's seen as, um, you know, again, acceptable where it's not too hot, not too cold. Um, the Goldilocks kind of... Um, uh, economy of, of, of inflation, if you get the reference. Um, whereas a, if inflation goes above the 2%, then actually that is seen as unacceptable currency devaluation. So inflation rising is actually currency devaluation. And in fact, this should say, and I should have put this one below 2%. Yeah, put that now. Um, inflation, right? If inflation is below 2% and maybe trending away from um, the 2% uh, target, so it's going to maybe 1 or 0 and then it goes into the minus, in fact, that is unacceptable currency appreciation. So if inflation goes towards the negative, towards 0, then in fact, the currency is appreciating. Right? Now, um, depending on what is going on with GDP and inflation will determine... Um, a central bank's uh, decision on what they would do with uh, interest rates. And uh, there's the interest rate cycle and pretty much interest rates um, do go in cycles. And so um, inflation, if inflation is above 2%, right? Central banks will typically tend to hike, right? And that leads to currency appreciation because what they want to do is actually counter, yeah, currency devaluation. So as we said, if inflation is above the 2% and trending away, then that is unacceptable currency devaluation. And to counter that, right, they need to hike rates so that, um, and hiking rates has the effect of appreciating, you know, creating demand for the currency, which should create a currency appreciation to kind of stem um, a currency devaluation caused by inflation. Now, if the central bank is on um, on hold, then currencies, um, the currency, uh, they accept the currency value. Yeah, so they 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 think to themselves that yeah, I, we like the currency at this value. Yeah, and the inflation, if inflation is below the two percent, then in fact they will typically tend to cut interest rates, and cutting interest rates 
to, it has the effect or can have the effect of depreciating a currency because if inflation is below 2%, that is unacceptable currency appreciation. And so again, to counter the appreciation um, of a currency, they have to cut rates to try to depreciate the currency so that they can stop the currency appreciating too much. And also as well, it's well worth noting that the uh, if you if uh, central banks hike too much, this will cause economic contraction. And I'm not going to get into that in this video, but again, I have um, a video um, explaining that, which I will uh, put in the top right hand side of the uh, of this video. So click on that maybe afterwards when you come back and maybe review this video. And so buy the rumor, sell the fact. Buying the rumor is what we do um, as fundamental uh, traders and having a fundamental approach because that's where the money is made. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's secondary whether the actual fact comes to pass, right? But the money is made in buying the rumor. That is, um, you know, we need to get ahead of the curve. And so um, that is really what the point is in fundamental analysis. It's getting ahead of everybody else and trying to get ahead of um, of uh, of these technical traders who have no idea what's going on and, you know, buying at uh, bargain prices and looking where something is expensive um, as well as uh, a bargain or a cheap or a discount and understanding that when if things are changing in the future, then in fact, currently this, you know, whatever price of a, you know, the exchange rate is of a, of a currency pair, in fact, that is probably cheap or it might be expensive, again, depending on what happens with, you know, gross domestic product, inflation and interest rates. So it's all about buying the rumor. The fact, whether it comes true or not, is secondary. And so let's look at central bank policy differentials because that's what we're ultimately trading in, in currency lands and euro dollar, obviously the, the most traded currency in Forex. And so um, when we're looking at GDP, uh, inflation and interest rates, we're comparing those, um, you know, Europe's um, data with the uh, US data and seeing where the differentials are yeah so um if a uh, one central bank for example is hawkish right very hawkish hawkish meaning that they are likely to hike interest rates compared to a currency that is not as hawkish or maybe a bit dovish which means that they may want to either hold or cut rates then there's a differential there right because we know that hiking interest rates appreciates a currency Cutting rates devalues a currency. So the biggest kind of divergence you can get is when one current one central bank is hiking rates and another is cutting. But that doesn't necessarily happen all the time and every day. But you know, we what we're looking for is differences or as as to why one central bank um is likely to be a bit more aggressive in, you know, their hiking of rates currently. Um uh, compared to, for example, another, or why one central bank is likely to, for example, um, uh, continue hiking um, um, uh, and leading their hiking in terms of the other central bank, say central bank B is likely to hold first, kind of like a leading and lagging um, uh, dynamic, but we'll get into that maybe in another video. Anyways, Let's look at the differences between the euro and the dollar in January, February and March. And so what was happening in Europe in January? So euro, according to uh, to Bloomberg and an article in Bloomberg, um, traders were wagering that the ECB will raise rates by another th 140 basis points. Yeah, The euro's gains also reflect a surge of, of optimism over Europe's economic outlook, given lower gas prices and China's reopening which is seen as a boom for the trade. So to give us a bit of context, what was happening was in, in November, December, um, it was expected that the Europe would go into a recession because um, of higher gas prices. This is due to the Ukraine um, and Russia tensions and the war that was going on. And so uh, Europe were expected to go into a recession, but due to a um, some really warm weather um, and natural gas prices actually coming down, it helped the economy. And so the economy actually didn't go into a recession, it actually um, avoided a recession and started to grow a little bit. And although inflation, uh, you know, uh, was high, 
it helped the um, central bank um, uh, by uh, them actually being able to hike rates because if they went into a recession, then hiking rates in a recession actually makes things a lot worse. And so, um, yeah, inflation, although it was rising, they, Europe had a bit of a, um, a dodged a bit of a bullet in terms of uh, avoiding a recession. And so the traders, right, were placing bets that in fact, with rising inflation and uh, a decent economy, that the, you know, Europe were able to hike a lot more, so about 140 basis points, whereas in the US at the time, this is from the same article, only around 60 basis points of further Fed tightening, right, tightening meaning hiking is priced for the rest of 2023. So you can see that the European Central Bank was, was being seen as being more hawk, way more hawkish uh, than um, the Federal Reserve were, right? So markets are now leaning towards a 25 basis point hike, rate hike, right, sorry, rate rise from the Fed come February, the smallest in nearly a year. And so, Again, you can see the hawkishness between the two. The European Central Bank was seen as being way more hawkish and the Fed actually was seen as, uh, as again, less hawkish, slightly dovish. So what happened on the charts in January? Let's look at January. And so this is from the beginning of 2023 at the beginning. And we can look at, you know, until February the 1st. And again, what was expected, you know, happened. So, um in our private mentoring group, Discord group, uh, you know, we've been long, and I've said I've been long since the end of December, um, you know, right at the beginning of January, somewhere around there. And we had a long bias on the Euro dollar or getting on the long on the Euro. And so, um, you know, this is basically is, you know, what, what played out. And so uh, many of the traders will attest to this, uh, many made uh, a decent amount. And so, yeah, for the whole of uh, January, it had a long bias, right? Getting in long on that euro dollar, and that's pretty much what played out. So let's go to um, February euro dollar. So Europe, um, European Central Bank may need to deliver uh, another half point interest rate increase after a planned hike of that size at next month's meeting, according to the Governor Council member Class Not. And so. Um, I think in February they did hike by 50 basis points and the uh, the consensus was that they probably may need another um, 50 basis point hike in order to uh, try to combat inflation. But there was a shift, in fact, with the uh, Federal Reserve, right? Whereas, um, well, in this month we had the Federal Reserve officials uh, could shed light on how many policymakers saw the case for a larger interest rate increase at their last meeting, whether they anticipated the need to take rates higher than previously thought to tame persistently high inflation. And so remember the previous month, we saw that the market was expecting probably around about 60 basis points for uh, for the rest of 2023. What had happened was is that inflation was um, was a bit sticky and so persistently high and so to get again inflation down you know the uh, the market kind of changed its view or slightly amended its view to think that or the federal reserve did as well um was that the rumor was was that the um they may actually hike more than in, uh, expected yeah and so with that being said um the market had to price that in so though the euro was still hawkish in fact there was a you know a, a much more hawkish uh, sentiment to the dollar right which then should mean that the um the dollar would have to be revalued and appreciate a bit more against the dollar right because that there was a change in sentiment and if we go to february so february 1st to march the 1st this is basically what you saw right you saw prices start to you know make lower highs lower lows as the rumor of a 50 basis point hike was coming into play yeah and again it was a rumor because it actually did not happen so um, I think they hiked by 25 basis points but the rumor was that they may hike more than expected and so that had to be priced in um, to the market whereas the month before they were seen as maybe being a bit dovish yeah 
So that is pretty much what had happened during the charts on February. Now into March. So Euro um, money markets, uh, money markets traders briefly priced in a 4% ECB terminal rate in the wake of the releases, which would exceed the peak in borrowing costs um, at the turn of the century. That compared to a 3.5% expected earlier this year, with traders now betting the ECB will keep raising rates through February 2024. And so, in fact, that was very, very hawkish for the euro and the market uh, was expecting even more rate hikes than they had previously expected sorry, the month before. And so again, just similar to what happened with the US um, in February, where there was a bit of a change in, in hawkishness. In fact, um, money markets had priced in a higher um, uh, terminal interest rate. And so, you know, from, from uh, uh, two, four, from 3.5%. And so that was quite hawkish for the euro. Whereas in Europe, uh, the statement is, is, it says, now we are starting to feel those long and variable lags with, uh, sorry, with which monetary policy works. Bellerina uh, Urucci, chief US economist at T. Rowe Price Associates, told Bloomberg Television on Friday. The first sign of that is, I think, what we are seeing with Silicon Valley Bank here. Lots of businesses and banks we are going to find this year aren't able to operate at these higher interest rates. So again, to give this a bit more context, um, we all know what we should know all about, you know, Silicon Valley Bank collapsing and other banks, I think Silver, is it Silvergate Bank or something like that? Um, and there were you know, banks in the US that were uh, failing and this was brought on by higher interest rates. And so, um, well, one of the factors was high interest rates. So let's go back to when I pretty much was talking about hiking too much causes economic contraction. So um, borrowing and lending costs were obviously affecting um, the banks as it was going higher, as the Federal Reserve were hiking. And that was just one of the effects of, um, of hiking interest rates on the economy and on you know companies and banks. And so the sentiment really was that how can the Federal Reserve continue to be uh, very hawkish and continue to hike if there may be more banks in problems? And yes, there were European banks, you know, that were in problems. I think it was Deutsche Bank um, had a bit of a bailing out as well. Uh, but it was seen that the US banks were in a lot more problems than European banks. And so... Um, when you have you know a bit of a credit crunch and a credit crisis where um, the US is most affected, it means that if you know there's a credit crunch, that would mean a contraction in the economy, and a contraction in the economy may mean obviously a recession sooner rather than later. And again, hiking in that environment is not prudent because if you keep hiking, you're going to um, exacerbate the um, uh, the uh, a potential for a um, a recession, right? You're bringing the recession closer to you, and so the you know Europe, while they had you know the uh, uh, quite a hawkish bias, um, which did you know later change to be a bit more cautious as well alongside the Federal Reserve, there was still a hawkishness, or they were still and still are more hawkish than the um, Federal Reserve currently in terms of interest rate hikes. So what happened during uh, March and this played out again, a more hawkish European Central Bank. There was a bit of a bit of a wobble, but ultimately we ended up going higher. And in fact, sorry, I haven't actually um, should actually uh, uh, da, 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 cancel this. One sec, sorry. Right, so here we are. Let me just do year to date. Yeah, so here we are in March. Yep, yeah, so from here to here. In March, we had prices really kind of move around 400 pips from the low. Nice buying opportunities at these lows before prices went to the upside in March. And so, um, you know, we're seeing the, the divergence between both central banks 
again, play out into April and into May as nothing's really changed uh, per se. The European Central Bank are still more hawkish than the Federal Reserve and are expected to hike more than the Federal Reserve. And you're seeing obviously prices drift higher. And so with that, doing a bit of a fundamental review, it's looking at the actual data, looking at GDP, we can see that um, the US is are the blue uh, columns and you've got the uh, European growth rate as represented by uh, the dots. And so we can see that from January into April, we've seen a slight you know, decline in terms of GDP growth rate for the US. But in fact, in Europe, we had um, we've had a bit of a, a bit of growth, right? Prices have gone to the upside. Um, yeah, the number is lower um, in terms of growth rate, but remember that the European Central Bank was supposed to go into a recession, and the fact that they avoided recession, two negative quarters of growth, right? They avoided that, and so that was seen as an absolute positive for uh, Europe. Yeah, so. We've had a bit of a divergence there where we had one central um, one economy, uh, you know, contracting and one actually, you know, growing, although be it, you know, quite slightly. And then we've got inflation rate. And so the US inflation rate, again, has come down to around 5% uh, on here on this axis. On the, on the right hand side, we've got the European inflation, which is actually around 7%. And you can see it slightly ticked up as well, the latest... Um, uh, inflation data so uh with that being said uh, let me go back so um inflation obviously for the us is coming down whereas although it's come down recently for the uh, for the european central bank it's a a lot higher than the us and b it's um on the upturn slightly so it looks like the, again the european central bank are likely to be a lot more hawkish than the um than the us and we can see what's happened with interest rates um, since the beginning of the year. And you can see in February, um, the European Central Bank hiked by 50 basis points, whereas the um, the Federal Reserve actually hiked by 25 basis points. And then you had another 50 basis point hike by the European Central Bank. And then you had only a 25 basis point hike um, from March into, into April, right? And so, whereas the European Central Bank has hiked by 1% or 100 basis points, the Federal Reserve only hiked by 50 basis points or 0.5%. So again, very hawkish from the European Central Bank. And so, again, seeing that on price, it's no wonder you're seeing, you know, prices grind, you know, a lot, you know, higher. And um, towards the end of the year, um, what's expected is that the uh, European uh, Euro dollar should reach at least 115. So let's see if that actually comes to play and comes out, to, uh, comes to fruition, right? Anyways, just some notes, uh, it's things you must be aware of. So data must support the narrative. You must, you know, have um, the data support your trade idea. Now we're dealing with trade probabilities, right? There are no certainties and no one has a crystal ball. And so when you've developed a trade idea and you've got a trade idea, um, you can continue to kind of hold the trade or have that, you know, bias. If, for example, um, let's say the European Central Bank are hiking rates, they want to hike rates. And let's say the data supporting that narrative would be a continued, you know, in rising inflation and supporting that may be a decent economy, right? Economy still growing. That 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 data will support the cent uh, the European Central Bank hiking, right? Now, if the if Europe are going to go into a deep recession, then it's going to be difficult for the European Central Bank to hike in that environment. And so, you know, it's you you can't start to say, all right, then well, I'm just going to start, you know, buying the European Central Bank if the data doesn't support the narrative. If inflation starts coming down, then then although yes, in this day currently today, you know, the, the European Central Bank are more hawkish than the um, than the Federal Reserve. That can change if inflation starts to drop like a stone. Then the European Central Bank are going to say, well, what's the point in hiking if inflation is coming down naturally and normally? There's no need to hike, and so. Um, data must support the trade idea narrative. Yeah. And there are, again, no probabilities, no certainties in trading. 
Um, uh, so then the probabilities, we deal with the probabilities and there are no certainties in trading and think bigger picture. So um, there's lots of data points that can get you confused and distracted. The best thing is to think about the bigger picture um, observe the higher time frames. Look at the daily and weekly time frames. Uh, try not to get drawn into every single lower time frame, every five minute, you know, support or supply zone and or trade setup because you can have situations where you might get a pullback. Right now, um, in in March, you had a you had a nice move from this high to or this low to this high. Right now. There's, there was a pullback of around 200 pips. Yeah, this pull this pullback on the daily was around 200 pips, something like that. From that high to that low, 217 pips. And so, if you were to zoom in on this onto like you know some sort of 15 or five minute chart, a lot of traders will try to you know will say, oh well, you know what Leon said that um, you know I should be bullish. I've done my fundamental analysis and I want to be bullish on this you know this currency pair. Now, yes, you're making the right choice in terms of being you know your directional bias, but ultimately you still have to understand that um, there's there's value, right? You're buying at highs. Don't buy at highs. If this is a move that has gone you know several hundred pips from this low to this high. In fact, what you should be doing is looking for discounts, yeah, discounts. And one of the discounts I look for is fair value. And um, and so if you go back to if I go back to the daily time frame chart, uh, between this high and this low, yeah, fifty percent of that would represent fair value. So what happened was is that you can see here that price came down to fair value. Right, and that was really the area that you'd probably now want to start to look for a trade setup. If you're looking for every five minute, ten minute trade setup, you could be right about your direction, but because you're buying at highs and the you know the institutions want to buy for discounts, pullbacks, you know, two hundred pips might seem like a, a trend on a on a five minute time frame, but it's really just a pullback. And if you understand the fundamental bias, just really kind of zoom out and look at where you are in context of you know where expensive is where cheap is and don't fomo in at highs right don't fomo in in these areas wait for the pullback wait for a decent price pullback fair value and then look for potential uh long trades right um and that's not necessarily me telling you you know a strategy or anything like that but just giving you the context of um of uh, why you should kind of zoom out and look at the the, the, the the higher time frame, the bigger time frames, and give yourself a bit of context. Then once prices pull back into a nice you know zone and maybe support or resistance or supplies you know or demand zone that you want to look to get involved in, then maybe go down into the lower time frame, start to look for some entries or whatever your uh, your setup may be. Um, yeah. So look at daily, weekly time frames for context. Uh. Directional bias really doesn't change too often. And so, um, you know, I've been long on the euro pretty much now since the beginning of the year, as I mentioned before. And so that's what, what I'm releasing this in. I'm recording this actually in, in May. So um, it's been five months since I've been long on the euro and it hasn't really changed at all. Actually, it hasn't changed at all. And so directional bias, once you get a good trade idea, it doesn't necessarily train, change from week to week. Some traders will say, oh, well, what am I going to be going long this week or short this week? Um, if you have a good trade idea, um, you know, you can be in a trade for months. And again, I've... Uh, created a video um i think it was like maybe a couple years ago a few years ago where i was detailing how i was short on the euro dollar for a, um for a whole year in fact i was short for over a year but i just made a video similar to this where i detail month to month um you know my euro dollar short trades um and my bias and the reasons why and again i'll put that in the uh, uh the link in the uh top right hand side and so directional bias doesn't change too often it's not a week to week thing you can have a directional bias for a good few months um if not longer um once you once the data does support that narrative and um yeah that's pretty much it so um if you're still around watching this video thank you we'll forward you to the end and also as well um for the next video i thought i'd put it out there um if you've got a you know from for the second quarter uh, video i'll do these every quarter so if you want me to analyze a pair 
Um, just suggest it in the um, in the chat below if you're watching this on YouTube and the pair with the most you know likes or um, the most suggested pair I'll do a similar analysis to this video or the same analysis to this video on that currency pair so it could be pound dollar it could be pound yen it could be Aussie CAD you know just whatever you want but again the most popular um, pair the most suggested pair I will do a uh, second quarter analysis on that for you guys and uh, yeah finally there is mentoring available you know we can get access to the private discord community where you can take your fundamental analysis uh, really to the next level and go to trading180.com I don't really have um, the mentoring open 24-7 I do have periods where um, I have mentoring as I like to keep the group uh, small and um, really kind of focus on smaller groups and so uh, whenever the next opening is it will be uh, on the website for you to uh, to join then so uh, guys take care I hope you enjoyed the video suggest um, a pair that you want me to look back on and give you uh, the analysis on and uh, again the most uh, recommended uh, pair is what I would do anyways guys take care all the best speak to you soon